Now we are we are moving directly to the to the third presentation, which is going to be delivered by our able professor, Professor Abdul Razak Abdul Majid Alaro, uh, the pioneer professor of Islamic financial laws in West Africa region in general, not only in Nigeria, uh, who is a member of the advisory. Council of Experts of the Central Bank, uh, Financial Regulations Advisory Council of Experts of Central Bank Press. Uh, his presentation is going to be on the legal and regulatory framework of Islamic banking in Nigeria, GAFs and future outlook. But before I invite Prof for the presentation, I would like to briefly uh, read his citation, even though he is not in the industry, but at least for some of us that are not uh, much acquainted with his uh, expertise. Professor A. A. Alaro is a Sharia expert, barrister, and solicitor of Supreme Court of Nigeria, and an internationally certified arbitrator. His area of specialization is Islamic financial transactions with emphasis on banking, insurance, and capital market, and has published in reputable pre-reviewed journals, peerly reviewed journals across the world. Currently, he's a professor and head of the Department of Islamic Law, Faculty of Law, University of Ilorin, a member of the Central Banks of Nigerians Advisory Council of Experts, and a member of Advisory Council of Nigerian National Insurance Commission. He has also served as advisor consultant to the Debt Management Office, DMO, Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and National Pension Commission, among others. He also heads the Research and, and Translation Committee of the Union of African Muslim Scholars with headquarters in Bamako, Mali. Professor Alaro is an alumnus of Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia, where he graduated with first class degree in 1993 and was listed in 2017 as one of the most outstanding alumni of the university worldwide. Professor Alaro has also been invited to speak in many high impact fora including International Islamic Liquidity Management Roundtable on Sukuk, African International Conference on Islamic Finance, uh, SAWAS Workshop on Islamic Finance University of London, World Halas Expo, to mention but a few. Professor Alaro is a renowned scholar, preacher, and sheikh. Whoever, uh, whoever interacts with him will bear witness to this. You are welcome, sir. And you have, as uh, usual, uh, 20 minutes for this presentation. We are very mindful of the time because we are behind the shuttle time. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. First and foremost, let me begin by saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, it's, it's really my pleasure to also be part of this program uh, that is not just celebrating guys at 10, uh, but also uh, is an opportunity to chronicle the achievements so far and even the challenges, as well as looking into the future. Uh, how can we move the Islamic banking industry to a higher level? Uh, I appreciate the Jais Bank MD and his team, Malam Hassan Osman, and his entire team. Um, so uh, can I share my screen? Yes, uh, Prof. Quiet, please. OK, OK. Am I sharing now? Perfect, Prof. You can go ahead, please. OK. Um, so having said this and, uh, and being mindful of the time constraint within just 20 minutes, uh, I am to discuss the legal and regulatory framework of Islamic banking in Nigeria uh, to identify gaps and also the future outlook. Um, when we talk of the legal uh, framework, 
uh, for Islamic, sorry, the screen is not moved, okay. Um, the legal framework, let's, let's take uh, an overview of the legal framework of Islamic or popularly known as non-interest banking in this part of the world. The overarching legal framework for Islamic banking in Nigeria is the constitution itself. Uh, uh, the strongest backing for the operation of Islamic banking in the country is the constitution, the ground law, the highest law in the land. By virtue of section 38 of the constitution, which guarantees freedom of religion for every citizen, this freedom is extended to also cover freedom to manifest one's religion in practice and observance. And this is where the practice of Islamic banking and the observance of the ethos, the rules, the regulations and principles of non-interest of Islamic banking will become handy. So practicing Islamic banking as Jais and others are doing uh, is, is supported completely by the constitutional provision in this particular section. And I must also add here that contrary to uh, some claims in some quarters, this is not in conflict with section 10 of the constitution. That is the section that says, Nigeria as a state shall not adopt any religion as a state religion. Evidence abound all over the world that adoption or introduction of Islamic or non-interest banking is not synonymous with the adoption of a state religion. Whoever is saying this uh, may be saying that uh, mischievously, but the truth of the matter is that we have a lot of countries, more than 80 countries of the world today, where in this form of banking is thriving, it's been practiced. Some of them are Christian or non-Muslim dominated countries. We can mention countries like UK, US and the rest of them. So uh, this is a very good foundation for us. We have the strongest backing of the constitution uh, in this section that I've just mentioned. In addition to that, I'm happy uh, one of the founding fathers, although he may not like himself to be addressed that way, Alagi Lere preceded me in talking this morning. Uh, he has mentioned Bofia. That is another very strong legal framework for the operation of Islamic banking in this country. Uh, bank and other financial banks and other financial institution act, Bofia, uh, is another legal framework for Islamic banking in Nigeria. Uh, this is also not free from controversy, but I'm happy to say here this morning that the unnecessary controversy on whether what Alaji Lere referred to as profit and loss sharing bank allowed in Bofia is the same as non-interest banking. Because we had it, uh, some people uh, will argue that what the law allows you to do is poor profit and loss sharing banking, not non-interest banking. You know, sometimes uh, in this part of the world, we like to make a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, I don't see any difference all over the world. These are nomenclature. These are terminologies that are used interchangeably all over the world. Let me give you an example of a close country to us in Nigeria. In Morocco, up till today, all their Islamic banking institutions are known as PLS institutions. al bonoku Tasharukiya. That is the official name up till this morning in Morocco. So Islamic banking, non-interest banking, PLS banking are all the same. But fortunately, this controversy lingered on for some times, and we all know. And uh, we must give kudos to our legislators, the lawmakers in Nigeria. They've done a good job in collaboration with other stakeholders, Central Bank and others. By coming up with a new set of law, Bofia 1991 that was referred to by Alaji Lere uh, is no more in, in operation. That law, uh, that act has now been replaced with Bofia 2020. And this controversy through Bofia 2020 has been permanently laid to rest. When you take banks and other financial institution acts 2020, the recent law, it has plethora of provisions 
many sections of Bofia 2020 expressly provide for non-interest banking. And that is why you can see on my screen, uh, I've referenced some of those sections, section two sub five B, section three sub one D, section four sub one, and the list goes on and on. All these are express provisions that leave no ambiguity as to what the law allows in Nigeria, call it non-interest banking, call it uh, profit and loss sharing banking, and even call it Islamic banking, if you wish, as Britain, the Great Britain did by allowing Islamic banking of Britain, IBB, to be registered in that country. So that is uh, another very strong legal framework that we have for the operation of Islamic banking in the country. Now, looking at the future, um, I believe strongly that what we have the situation today in Nigeria does not support having a very strong Islamic banking industry. Why? Uh, a lot of regulations that we are using to supervise, to run, to manage Islamic banking in Nigeria today are in the form of what we call subsidiary legislations. These are guidelines, rules, and regulations issued by the central bank governor, although who is empowered to so doing. But if you ask any lawyer, they will tell you a subsidiary legislation is not as strong as having a primary legislation. I think looking at the future now, an industry that has grown from being one to becoming about, uh, we have three full-fledged now, we have a lot of windows and it continues to grow. I think it is high time. We've, give, we've given kudos a short while ago to our legislators. We still need to call on them to do the needful. It's high time that we have a whole set of primary legislation that will take care of what, of all that is needed to strengthen this ever-growing industry. If we do that, we will be following good precedent and best practices all over the world. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Um, Ziad spoke before me this morning. You can see him a questionnaire raised that you kept on mentioning Malaysia, Malaysia, because Malaysia is leading globally. But what we should note is that one of the reasons why Malaysia is so successful in this industry is the backing of the law. Malaysia achieved this milestone that we are calling on our legislators in Nigeria to achieve as far back as 2013. They also started like us, but when it got to a stage, they felt the need and they did exactly what was needed to be done by enacting a law, an act called Islamic Financial Services Act, IFSA 2013. Alongside, they have their own BOFIA. Their own BOFIA is called FSA, Financial Services Act 2013. So the two laws are in operation today, and that is in the interest of a stronger Islamic banking industry. We are also calling for that by way of looking at the future for this industry. And now I'm going to quickly, uh, for the rest of the time, now point at regulatory issues that I think need to be addressed if we really need, if we really want to uh, move uh, this industry forward. And we must also strive, we must all strive for that because it's good for the country. Uh, we don't need to say more than what Alain Guilherme has said, uh, what President Obasanjo has said, what uh, former Deputy Governor uh, uh, Mr. Tunde Lemo has said. We don't, need, we don't need more than that to prove that Islamic banking is not only good for Muslims, it's good for the entire citizens of this country. Not just this is good for other citizens of the world. Now, there are regulatory issues that I will just uh, uh, refer to uh, we may not have enough time to go into details. But the first one I want to raise here is that the regulator itself, represented by the Central Bank of Nigeria, is in need of human resources development and capacity building for regulators. Uh, there is a principle in law that says, Nemo dat quod non abe. You don't give what you don't have. Nobody can give what he doesn't have. It's very clear. Um, with due respect, 
uh, as an insider to a certain extent, being an advisor and consultant to central bank and other regulatory bodies of Islamic banking and finance in the country, in the country, I think I have that uh, privilege information uh, that what we have today, we didn't, we we do not have yet sufficient human resources that can man the industry at the regulatory level. You know, it's not only do uh, uh, that what you don't have you can't give but you must even be a step ahead of the operators operators should not be more knowledgeable than regulators if you want to have effective and efficient regulation you actually need to be a step ahead of them the reality today is that operators in most cases are more knowledgeable than regulators and that will tell you uh the the, 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 the deficiency that we can have in such a regulatory environment. So I'm calling on the central bank as the regulator uh, to scale up. I know it's doing uh, a lot in this direct in this direction, but it needs to be scaled up by developing more human resources and building more capacity for its staff, particularly in this department that I've highlighted, the banking supervision department, uh, financial policy and regulation department, and of course, the phrase sectarian, which is also housed in the FPRD. Uh, uh, and in so doing, Central Bank has the full backing of the law to do this. Uh, let me read unto you what we have in section 10 sub 2 of the Interpretation Act in Nigeria. It says, any an enactment that which confers power to do any act shall be construed as also conferring all such other powers as are reasonably necessary to enable that act to be done or are incidental to the doing of it. What we are saying is this, to have operators, uh, regulators that will be a step or steps ahead the operators is actually necessary to enable the regulation of Islamic banking industry, which the CBN is empowered to do by law. Uh, and let me also clear any doubt. This is not in any way calling for special job opportunities for Muslims. It's not true. At the central bank today, we have people who are non-Muslims and are part of the machinery that are part of the team managing, supervising, and regulating the Islamic banking industry. If you have the knowledge, the door is open for you. In fact, uh, I largely Ray will bear witness to this. Uh, for the whole period that I've served so far, as advisor and consultant to Central Bank of Nigeria. I've never had a Muslim to head the phrase sectarian. All the past and present head of phrase sectarian, which I belong to as a member, they are all non-Muslim. They have all been non-Muslims. So we, we, we should do what is good for the country and don't we shouldn't allow uh, uh, feelings uh, to, to Number two, I hope the time will permit me. I have about six or seven of them. Uh, regulation and oversight function. We are a third party apart from an Islamic or non-interest bank is involved. This is also a problematic area of the regulation of Islamic banking in the country. CBN is doing well, very well in the areas of regulating banks that are under its regulatory purview. But by the nature of by nature of Islamic Bank, you will have some other parties who are not banks that will be part of the operation. Let me refer to good, the two examples here. NPIs, for example, non-permissible income, a bank, an Islamic bank may have, not by way of choice, but by way of accident or by, by whatever reason something may come into it as a non-permissible that will be declared as being non-permissible. Now, the, the, the regulation is that it must be channeled to charity. The bank must never benefit from it. But some banks in Nigeria, I think that is inclusive, uh, have now come up with an idea of, find, of having foundations that will be the one disbursing these funds on behalf of the banks, which is a welcome idea. 
But we ran into a big problem when the foundation now thought that it can operate without any regulation from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Meanwhile, the bulk of the money that is at your disposal is coming from a bank. So it, it was, it was a, 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 a very huge controversy that erupted because as money coming from an, from an, Islam, from an Islamic bank, CBN must actually know how it is going to be spent and disbursed. So this is one area that I think we need to strengthen our regulatory uh, oversight when a third party is involved. We don't stop at regulating the banks alone when we have other parties involved in the transaction. Another example here, and it's very, very unfortunate. We have what we call uh, economic intervention schemes. Uh, we have targeted credit facility because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the difficulties imposed on people in their businesses and the rest of them. CBN came up, uh, federal government through CBN came up with interventions. But again, as an Islamic bank, the way Islamic banking operates is that you cannot just give people money and exchange them to and, and expect them to pay back and have they return to it. There must be an asset bought and sold. So there was a need to involve some vendors, some businessmen and women, and they are actually making mockery of the whole of the whole thing. What is what is playing out today is that when a beneficiary comes to most of the vendors, and I have my uh, evidence for saying so, they will just arrange with them that instead of you buying and going to sell or whatever, we don't have all this product. CBN has approved 500,000 for you. Why not you taking 450 and let's retain 50,000 Naira? Meanwhile, at the end of the day, you will have to repay the whole 500,000. This is a riba based transaction. It's no more Sharia compliant. This is not coming from the banks, I must confess, but it's coming from third parties that are not any other regulatory purview of the central bank, the owner of the fund. We need to do something in that respect. The next one has to do with taxation of Islamic banking products. The tax authorities must work in a way in synergy with central bank and other regulators in a manner that will not strangulate the industry, that will help the industry to thrive and, and develop. Now, for example, we have received complaints from some of the operators, some of the non-interest banks in Nigeria, that when you ask us to isolate MPI, remember I told you, MPI is not an income for the bank, non-permissible income. It's not an income for the bank. But what is happening is that the tax authorities will insist on taxing MPI before disbursing it to charity. It doesn't help. The bank is not benefiting in any way from MPI, and yet you want to impose tax on it uh, for holding for uh, uh, holding such an amount of money that is pr primarily meant for charitable causes. Another area of this that I will advise that regulators should work in synergy to find a solution to is what takes place sometimes uh, in form of double taxation of Islamic banking product. Again, we have to look at the peculiarities, the specificities of this banking order. A Morobaha product, for example, yes, the bank will own temporarily, but it is not owning for the, so, for, for, to, for, uh, uh, for the sake of just owning to become an asset of the bank. It will instantly transfer same to the customer. Now, when you tax the product, when uh, the bank buys from the vendor, and again, you also tax by the time the bank is transferring ownership, to uh, the customer, it amounts to double taxation. And in any economy, double taxation is not helpful for the growth of any economy. So we want to uh, draw the attention even of the tax authorities and uh, to work in synergy with other regulators. So you know your, your, time, you, you, your time is, uh, is, is, is almost finished, but uh, kindly round up in a few minutes, please. It's almost, it's, right. it's almost getting to an end. Uh, okay, you know, I told you sir. about seven or the other, but I think this is the fifth one. Uh, okay. NDIC and NIB uh, deposit insurance. Uh, the deposit insurance uh, uh, scheme in Nigeria, 
The law up till today is that any deposit in any Nigerian bank, be it conventional or non-interest, is covered by NDIC insurance. But we have to take cognizance again of the specificities of this banking order. When you have a current account deposit, yes, you can guarantee that, you can ensure that, but it is totally non-Sharia compliant for you to guarantee savings account that is operated on the basis of Mudoraba. Mudoraba is an investment account and you don't guarantee neither the capital nor the return in any investment, except in cases of, uh, in cases of uh, 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 negligence, or other practices that are not allowed on the part on the part of the operators. But generally, what is taking place today is that it's like uh, a general rule that any deposit in any Nigerian bank must actually be covered under NDIC insurance. That also needs to be looked into. Another area is sometimes circulars will emanate from Central Bank of Nigeria as a regulator of all banks, irrespective of your nature, irrespective of, of, the, uh, of the transactions, whether you are conventional or non-interest banking. But again, taking cognizance of the peculiarity, specificities of this banking system. Uh, we received a complaint sometimes ago uh, that the same um, uh, uh, intervention scheme that I mentioned a short while ago, CBN thought it wise, and it was a very good decision that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a regulatory forbearance that reduced the rate of return payable on any facility. Then immediately after the COVID-19 pandemic, a circular came to all banks to restore back the original rate of return before COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, some of the non-interest banks in Nigeria have actually given out those facilities under a Morobaha arrangement. In a Moroba arrangement, price must never change. Rate must never change. It's a sale product. Once you have sold your asset, the sale price remains the same from the beginning to the end. You don't have that liberty of changing prices or changing rate of return in any Moroba product. Uh, last but not the least, this is the penultimate one. Uh, Sharia compliance and Sharia audit in our non-interest or Islamic banks. Uh, it is not a good practice to have the two under one umbrella, under one head of a unit or a department, because they have to work uh, as a check. One has to work as a check for the other. If you now put both the Sharia auditor and the Sharia compliant officer under one single head, as Sharia unit, as Sharia department, uh, it's actually not, it's, it's not uh, going to work the way it ought to be. Compliance is an ex ante process, while audit is an ex post activity. So we need to separate between Sharia unit and Sharia audit and the Sharia compliance department in our non-interest or Islamic banks in the country. And finally, Mr. Moderator, this is the last one. Uh, <laughs> Non-interest banks, regulations, and judicial interpretation. I must say a word on this, uh, because uh, if care is not taken, uh, issues that others have had in some other countries and have come out of it after a lot, a lot of sovereign, a lot of action, we don't need to go the same way. What I'm trying to say is that um, the, uh, the law in the country gives jurisdiction in adjudicating banking matters to high courts. Uh, and when it is in a matter of customer banking, as uh, customer banker relationship, it doesn't even make any difference whether it is a federal high court or a state high court. Just a high court can hear such a case. But the issue now is that do we have Competent, uh, let, me, uh, let me withdraw that word. They are competent. But do we have people that are versed in Islamic uh, commercial law in those courts to adjudicate on matters relating to Islamic finance? An instance here that is worrisome. Uh, in this case, System Property Development Consortium Limited and one other, and Jais Bank. Jais Bank is a party. Uh, was a party in that case. The summary of the fact is this. 
we have what we call in Islamic banking industry, not just in Nigeria, all over the world. It is there to safeguard the interest of the industry, not to kill industry by some unscrupulous element, by some people that do not mean well for the industry. What do we mean by penalty for default is that if you default on any product with, within between you and an Islamic bank, if it is for a good reason, we will apply the Quranic verse. Uh, 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 for, 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 uh, the, the Quran says, if anybody is in the difficulty of paying, then give them some respite. But what of whoever is deliberately defaulting or delaying the payment of what is due to an Islamic bank? And that is why scholars all over the world have come up with this uh, innovative solution that we can have a penalty that will be imposed on the defaulter that is defaulting not on account of not having money to pay, but deliberately doing that to harm an Islamic bank. But at the same time, it becomes a non-permissible income that such a bank will never benefit from. But in this case, the judge did not see it that way. He equated the penalty for default to a loan or to an interest being charged on a loan facility, which is not allowed for an Islamic bank to do. We agree on that. But the concept of default penalty for default is totally different. It's totally different from allowing a bank to charge uh, interest on loan. And that is why it is normally said that whatever is charged as penalty must be channeled to charitable causes. So this is, uh, as I told you, uh, Malaysia is another good example. They had these issues at the beginning of uh, the development of Islamic banking industry. And that is why, look at part of what they did back then. They introduced a section into their central bank law. The Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009, section 56 sub 1 says, we are in any proceedings relating to Islamic financial business before any court or arbitrator, any question arises concerning a Sharia matter the court or the arbitrator, as the case may be, shall take into consideration any published rulings of the Sharia Advisory Council. That is the equivalent of phrasing that. For such questions, Sharia Advisory Council uh, for its ruling. This is a good practice. But if you cannot do that in Nigeria, the way out, the way forward in Nigeria, we can simply expand the jurisdiction of Sharia Court of Appeal to become a court of first instance in Islamic banking matters. We have Sharia uh, lawyers, Sharia judges, who have the requisite knowledge and expertise in this particular area. We can simply have an expansion of their jurisdiction, but that will require, I know, a constitutional amendment. And that is why I'm suggesting, in the absence of that one being done, uh, CBN as a regulator can simply constitute a special tribunal uh, and this will not be the first time it will happen in this country. We have precedent in the investment and security tribunal that is being used for capital market related matters. We have tax appeal tribunal for tax related dispute arising from operations of various tax laws. So these are good precedents that the CBN as a regulator can also follow uh, in uh, managing this very, very a delicate matter that we shouldn't allow to degenerate into a bigger crisis for the industry. Uh, and with this, uh, once again, I thank you for your attention and I thank the organizers, the Jais Bank, PLC, for putting on up this important program. And I wish you more and more successes in the years to come. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, very much for this wonderful and resourceful presentation. Indeed, we have all learned from the vast of uh, your knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in abundance and increase you in wealth and health. Uh, indeed, Prof have, has highlighted uh, so many important issues uh, ranging from the regulatory basis or legal basis for the non-interest uh, finance in the country right from the Bofit of 1991, moving to Bofia of 2020, which uh, clearly highlighted some basic or specific components regarding to Islamic uh, or non-interest finance in the country. 
and uh, Prof has, has, has called upon all and sundry to push and work towards realization of a substantive or primary legislation which will replace the subsidiary legislation that we have in the country, uh, which we are going to copy from the countries that are advanced in Islamic finance, Malaysia and Indonesia, to mention uh, some of these countries. And uh, finally, Prof has, has, has also called on the need for establishing a very strong uh, litigation system or arbitration, which will take care of all cases to avoid, or to avoid any uh, issue that will uh, lead into problems in the future. Thank you very much, Prof. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in abundance. Now we're going to take some of the questions, if any. I can see so many questions, but uh, uh, this seems to be not much related to the presentation. Some are directly to the to the management of the bank. Uh, okay, there is one at Professor Alaro. Are there efforts by Islamic banking sector in Nigeria towards involving the management of pension and NHI scheme for those citizens that are interested in not interest transactions? Jazakallahu khairan. I think this is very uh, important question. Uh, Prof may, may kindly wish to chip in uh, regarding the pension. I believe maybe the, the person asking me is not aware of the uh, point six that was uh, introduced since last year by the PENCOM. So Prof kindly shed more light on this, the NHIS and the pension. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a very good question and, uh, and a question that will be agitating the minds of many. Uh, we uh, is, is, is a good development that has been happening in the industry. You know, this is what we have been calling for since the beginning. Islamic finance is like a value chain uh, activity. You have banking, it must go with other value chain components. That is why when you are developing your banking, you must look at ways of developing your insurance, developing your capital market, and now developing your pension uh, a scheme and even a mortgage system as represented by NHIS. So the good news I have for you is that this has already taken place. In the pension arrangement now, uh, pension the pension uh, scheme regulator has come up with what it calls pen, uh, Fund 6 that allows any Nigerian and free of charge, no pension administrator should charge you a dime for requesting that your fund be moved either from fund one, from two, three, majority of us are on fund four anyway, that you want to move from fund four or whatever to fund six. Fund six is that fund that will allow you to specify that I want my pension to be invested only in Sharia compliant businesses. That is possible today. And as the moderator rightly said, uh, it has been more than a year that uh, that has been in operation. So you can just uh, approach your pension administrator and uh, make that request. And I'm re re repeating that one. It is even free of charge. They shouldn't charge you any amount of money for moving. Now, uh, uh, the NHAIS, I also have very good news, although uh, this may not be known to many because it's a recent development. The Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria that is in charge of our uh, a contribution to the housing scheme, you know, by virtue of law, by law in the country, any employer must contribute about 2.5% or thereabout of your basic salary to that scheme. Uh, all we had in the past is that we only have we only had uh, a mortgage system that works only based on conventional system. But now, Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria has also come up with what it describes as Sharia compliant or non-interest mortgage system that I will also advise whoever is interested, uh, the questioner and others, to maybe visit a Federal Mortgage Bank branch in your state or in your city, or even through their website and see more and more information but this is also available today in the country. Alhamdulillah. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. One more question, and it's going to be the last due to the time constraint. Jazakumullah uh, khairan, Prof. Alaro. It is, uh, is it whose duty to make sure the primary legislation is enacted by the lawmakers? 
and who is responsible to stop taxation of non-permissible income? Uh, the first leg of that question, can you come again? The first leg? They say that who is whose duty is to make okay. sure that the primary legislation is enacted by the lawmakers uh, okay. to avoid or to, 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 to replace the subsidiary legislations that we are currently using. Who's Thank you. Is who is responsible? responsible. Whose duty yeah. is it? Yeah. Uh, we simply put it as the stakeholders, all stakeholders. It is their duty to make sure this happens. You as a Nigerian, you are a stakeholder. You can go through your representative in the House of Rep, through the senator representing you to sponsor a private bill. It's not that difficult. Stakeholders, uh, corporate bodies, banks, uh, uh, non-interest banks can form a group and see how they can go through any of our lawmakers. So in summary, uh, the process of lawmaking in any nation can come through many channels. It's not only the government that will push the bills to the National Assembly. We have what we call private members' bill, so that we can also be part of. Uh, and even, even the, the stakeholders, uh, the regulators are also stakeholders because they have an insight to what is happening better than others, better than even the legislators. They can tell them what is happening in other parts of the world as the best practice and advise them on the way forward. Uh, this is what I think should be done. The stakeholders generally have a duty and you and I are part of those stakeholders. The second one, uh, if you can remind me, please. It's on the MPI, taxation, double taxation of MPI, oh. taxation of MPI. Whose duty is to stop that again? Yes, yes. Well, of course, it's the, it's the tax authority, FIRS and other tax authorities in the country. But again, I will say, they may not pay attention to this. They may not be doing it deliberately to harm the industry. It is incumbent on whoever knows, the insiders, the regulators, the operators, to find ways of uh, uh, drawing their attention to this and giving them what they can compare and see of how this form of banking is regulated and taxed in other parts of the world that is making it to thrive and develop. So this is what I think should be done also in this respect. Thank you very much, Prof, for this wonderful presentation and your attention for giving us the time to learn a lot from you. Uh, actually, it is only because of the time. I know Prof has a lot to, to share with us, but the time will not permit. We thank you once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you in abundance and increase you in health and wealth. Uh, thank you once again. There are so many questions that are not directly related to the presentation made by the Prof. Uh, some are, uh, has to do with, uh, with, the, with the banking operations, some are asking the branches uh, where, and I believe, I believe the, the Secretariat of the bank is taking note of all this and uh, they will respond to some of these uh, requests, inshallah, in due course. Uh, now, uh, and also there are other requests for, for the slides of all presentation. So, uh, inshallah, uh, we're going to make it available after the presentation to all the participants.